as a director of the ACDHCH, I'm welcoming you to this tool gallery on prosopographical data modeling, and which is also the second part of the Digital Habsburg platform workshop. Um, let me provide you with uh, some short background information concerning the hosting institution. So the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage. Um, this institute, or let's say the former Institute Austrian Center for Digital Humanities of the Austrian Academy of Sciences um, was um, installed and implemented as a research institute at the Academy with um, the intention to foster the humanities by applying digital methods and tools uh, to a wide range of academic fields. Um, in late 2019, so we uh, underwent a major restructuring so that we since uh, January last year um, has been integrating new projects and groups also from the paradigm of cultural heritage and the uh, name of the institute um, has also been changed, was changed to Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage. So this explains a little bit this ACDHCH acronym. Um, a focus of our institute um, is, let's say, mirrored by this name. So one focus is on basic research in the humanities in so-called long-term projects, uh, for, for the development and um, the analyses of cultural heritage. And of course, the second part, very important part, is the research in the paradigm of digital humanities. And uh, our tool gallery series um, can be seen as a very central part of the educational agenda of our institute. The focus of today's tool gallery is uh, tool gallery is on approaches and tools and the framework of prosopography. And again, our um, organizational team managed to invite and to allure prominent experts in this field as his cousins, uh, moderators and presenters. Um, I think Elizabeth has already mentioned the name, but it would like to to um, uh, to do it again, uh, Victor de Bourg uh, from the University of Amsterdam, Hartlik Volkom, um, Daniel Jeller uh, from um, the already mentioned project Nuns and Monks, uh, Joni Tuominen from the University of Helsinki, Thomas Walnick from um, the Digital Habsburg platform, and um, two colleagues from the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage, uh, namely Matthias Schlügel and Matej Duercho. Uh, and I would like to express my uh, gratitude to these colleagues who will share and transfer their knowledge and competencies to the audience and the participants of this tool gallery. So my best wishes for the next two days. Good luck for the entire program and uh, thanks again and all the best. Thank you so much, Alex. We will move on to uh, Matej Giorgio, who will um, give us an introduction and give you a presentation that was, that was also supported by Thomas Valnik. Matej, the, fly, the floor is yours. So uh, welcome also from uh, my side. I'm happy I want to say that I'm quite happy that this is taking place and it was a wonderful um, it's a wonderful, it was a wonderful opportunity for us within the Institute to pull a few resources together to um, yeah kind of consolidate uh, on the example of the, on our, against the, the result of or the, the goal of having some training material for you and something to, to present and to, to discuss in this tool gallery we worked intensively in the two three weeks and thanks goes to all the colleagues um who contributed here uh to yeah to consolidate some material uh, uh, on the topic of data modeling which is at quite at the core uh, one of the really core activities within our institute um especially also and with the focus on, on semantic web semantic technologies okay uh the pains of so now i will try to give you a brief which uh, present the introduction, kind of motivation, where does this come from and uh, uh, what it is good for the data modeling. 
uh, and also a few basic concepts. So uh, it should be a quite a gentle and, and top top level bird's view uh, introduction into into the topic. Uh, the the idea of the whole this two days or two half days uh, two gallery setup is that we go from kind of this uh, abstract um, uh, and um, general ideas to more and more deeper than explaining or presenting or uh, introdu introducing the specific two data sets that will serve for the two days as our kind of guinea pigs on which we will explicate or, or make um, clear some of the aspects of the, of the modeling and then yeah and on, on second day the, the hands-on session will be more and more kind of uh, get your hands dirty and really work with the data and try to see what is there how it is how it uh, looks like and so on okay so uh motivation let's start here so why data modeling uh why should we even bother um there is one quote for from Sotis um uh, that uh, yeah the importance of data models and data modeling can be hardly overestimated well okay uh why um uh, we uh, because it's the modeling is the, is the point uh, kind of the point where it, that it goes comes together the, the humanistic understanding of a fraction of reality <laughs> or so what the researcher kind of looks uh, what the world looks like for a researcher with respect to a specific research question or some kind of uh, scope of, of a project uh, and uh, technical and the technical aspect of how to model structured data so that it can be processed in, in, in the systems. Um, so, yeah, so the main idea or goal uh, or purpose of modeling is to formalize uh, and make explicit concepts, entities, and relations of a given, given domain of discourse or whatever you call it. So, kind of the scope of what you are looking, the part of the world you are looking at, right? Uh, in our case now today we will be concentrating on prototopographical data but uh, many of the things that we will say apply in general for data modeling in whichever domain um, and why you would want to formalize and make it explicit i mean i guess you know all from or, uh, from, from the rest of, from normal uh, communications and situations that oftentimes it's it's not that clear if we understand each other, even if you use the same word, if the, if the persons have the same understanding of the concept of the term. Um, and yeah, so it's quite, so to say, oftentimes a bit fuzzy. Uh, but and for the research so that you can communicate and exchange, you need to come to an agreement on, on the understanding of, of the concepts or entities you are worth talking about. And even more so, so it's important this formalization is important for the communication among the whoever is involved, the stakeholders of a project. Uh, but it's even more important for technical implementation because machines are still not <laughs> clever enough to, to kind of pick the right uh, semantics and in, interpretation. So we have to be very uh, precise there to get to what, what you want. Um, so, kind of this formalization, this data modeling is one important step to actually be able to operationalize that. So, the, if you have a domain of discourse, to have a representation of it in in a system. And uh, la last but not least, it is also a uh, base or a required pre a precondition for any uh, work across projects for interoperability, a term which we will come to later one more, once more. Uh, so that you, when you want to look kind of connect data sets, for example, from different projects and so on, there you also, the data model, the clarification of the, of the concept and so on is, um, is crucial. Okay. So what is that data modeling again? It's a, or data model or data modeling is the goal to, uh, or conceptualization formalization of the object in relationship of a of an application domain modeling always means a reduction so you don't uh, represent the the reality in its full detail obviously it's not possible so we have to kind of pick what are the things that are relevant for your well and then 
for, for your research questions mainly or kind of what is the goal you want to achieve and based on that you will decide uh, what should be represented and what not. Like as an example, uh, if you, for example, model uh, prosopographical data information about persons, then you probably will have information about their birth date and death date and um, maybe other events within their life, but you probably won't model uh, when this person woke up in the morning or went to bed or uh, and, and, and that kind of the that level of detail. Even though, it, but in specific cases, it could be so, so there is no one rule, right? So it depends on your question. If you want to track the life of a person and you have that information that you may decide to be much more detailed there. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, another point is the abstraction. So we have to kind of find the common categories, how you want to refer to the, to the uh, entities that you are talking about so you can handle them, um, which is, called then classes or types. So for example, a person would be a typical class or, or type. And then all those individuals or the actual living persons would be of that class. So I think it's something intuitively understandable, I hope. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, and so uh, in our understanding, uh, data modeling is a crystallization or convergence point where uh, very three different aspects come together. So on the one hand, that is the information that you have. Uh, it could be some data in some sources. It could be what you know. Yeah, so that is the, 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 the facts, so to say. Uh, then on the other hand, there is also the aspect of technology. So uh, how the technology, so the technology you select to, to use, uh, that can also have influence on how you represent the uh, the information, but mainly uh, it, it's guided, uh, the data modeling is guided by the research questions or by the purpose of, so what you want to do with the data? Um, what is what is the goal? And also it's certainly uh, influenced by the school of thought or by your kind of what you, your background, if you wish, uh, from your discipline. Um, so probably an astronomer would look different. Or social scientists would, would look differently at the same inform, same kind of information or same application domain than a uh, historian or literary uh, somebody from literary studies. Okay, and and that means also that there is not one right model. So it's not like this is the right thing and everything else is false. But it, it, there are many ways to formalize uh, a specific domain to kind of which concepts are relevant, which relations should be represented. Um, and so on. Um, and so this is the pains of the data modeler to do the decisions to do, uh, or basically that's the data modeling to make the decisions on how to represent the information. Okay. Uh, also data model, there are many, I call it incarnations or many kind of variants or representations of, of what Ausprägungen in, in German of, of a data model. It could be a kind of a semantic or abstract conceptual model, which is could be a verbal description, uh, which is not formal. It's kind of on, on, on the on the uh, on the scale of the formalization. It would be rather loose still, so it's in in uh, normal speech uh, formulated. And then there are various formalizations. So a typical or very traditional one is integrated relationship model. I put a two slides there, two two graphics there to kind of give you an impression. Uh, on the right, uh, that's the an example of entity relationship model. You don't need to know, see the details, it's just to give you an idea what kind of, and this is a graphic representation of, of such a model, right? So it's a, a diagram which, which defines, okay, these are the, the main entities, these are their properties, and these are rela relations between, uh, between them. And uh, in uh, the, another representation is the so-called UML class diagram, uh, so the entity relationship model is mostly used for modeling, so for, for, for defining databases. UML class diagram is for defining structures in, in applications. So when you implement uh, <clears throat> uh, some model in, in an application, and it looks quite different, but it's quite, actually quite the same. So we also have the main kind of classes, which have properties, which are and which have relations among them. Uh, so, so the principle of, of is kind of, I would guess, and intuitively understandable that on the general level, you try to express the world uh, as, as a 
a combination of, of classes or, or entities uh, which some specific attributes or properties and the relation, relations among them. Okay. So uh, this is kind of still on the conceptual level or, or uh, yeah. And then, then the data model so that you can operationalize it and really use it in, in an application, uh, you need some technical implementation. And there are, again, multiple implementations of that. So you see there is kind of quite a, there is not, uh, yeah, uh, the data model has as many, many forms. Yeah, and it, it will be still the same data model that you devised, but one is drawn as a diagram, one is implemented in the database, one in the application. And so what are the technical <coughs> implementations? It's for one in traditionally, you know, you have some, you have some persistence store. So, okay, it could be a relational, traditionally it's a relational database. It could be meanwhile also other such kinds of, of storage, doesn't matter. Uh, but there in a relational database, for example, you put the tables with fields and they are connected among each other. Uh, that would be the implementation of the database. Then uh, normally you have an application which has an internal representation of the data model so that you can operate on, on the data. Uh, typically, this is implemented as classes with properties and methods. Methods means so you can do something with, with this information and uh, change it and so on. Then also you have to have a representation of the same information in the front end for the user, obviously. Uh, and increasingly, or best practices to also have the same information exposed by our API, so called API, which are application programmatic interfaces uh, in various civilization formats uh, for that, that is meant for consumption by other applications. So, that, and that's kind of the, at the core of interoperability that other applications can uh, use, the, uh, use the data. Uh, and, and access and use the, use the data for other purposes. Okay. Um, what else do I have? Okay, this is the interoperability. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, uh, so, so next to the first thing, uh, so that I can even in my project do something technical, so to say, with the data that I have or the information that I have, uh, we have to de define the data model to be able to communicate between people and machines, if you wish. Uh, but the next step is also, and what we will also concentrate on today, actually, is the idea of interoperability. So how can I reuse data across projects, across, that could be of different kinds, different kinds, but, but there may be of, of links or overlaps between the data on various levels. Um, and we have that situation a lot at the academy. You can imagine we have dozens of, of projects. Uh, many of them circle around the kind of, uh, if you want to kind of spatial and temporal scope would be some Vienna 1900, which kind of branching out in all direction. Uh, but but that's, we see a lot of kind of blocking or, or constant clustering of, of projects around this uh, spatial temporal uh, point. Um, and yeah, it feels like, it seems like natural to get, yeah, it could be, could be enriching or opens up new, new possibilities if you are able to combine, combine the data and have information about one entity from different projects and sources which have their specialized views. Um, and but the, oftentimes the projects use different data models with different technologies so how to bring them together um, and on the interoperability that's it's there's a lot of buzz around it uh, at the moment also as part of this so-called fair data principles fair standing from for findable uh, accessible interoperable and reusable in the end so the reusability is, is at the core um, i would like to point out that um, you have to consider it's not like data is interoperable per se it, you always have to consider it kind of, is it interoperable with respect to, to what? Because it means interoperability means, can I use it in a certain tool, for example? Uh, so, so basically the question is, uh, is the data or the, the, the format in which the data is, is it interoperable? Is it compatible with what the tool that I want to use is expecting? I maybe want to have a tool for linguistic analysis but it expects data in a certain form. So do I have that? So that's the, that would be one um, reading of interoperability. 
Uh, and the other is, uh, yeah, can, can I bring two data sets together? Um, um, and uh, the easiest would be if they share the same data model, uh, then it's kind of trivial. Uh, mostly they don't. Uh, so then you need to find ways how you can combine uh, data models, how you can uh, align them uh, and, and build kind of semantic bridges uh, among them so that you know what is meant by the one or by the other. Um, and and this is exactly what we will concentrate on also, especially tomorrow. Um, the question of uh, on which levels you can create this, these relations between the uh, between two data sets, uh, for example. Uh, do they share the same, do they refer to the same entities? Like they talk about maybe the same persons or the same places, but uh, refer to them uh, in a, more often than not by different terms. And so how can you establish the links? How can you establish the identity so that you know that actually this project is talking about the same person as this, this project. Okay, so this is the idea of interoperability and what we will dive into uh, later on. And we want to explicate this on two sample data sets, uh, which come from two projects uh, running currently. Uh, one is the so-called BNE scored, a uh, prosopographic portal of persons uh, at the BNE score, and don't ask me now which temporal coverage it is, I guess 18th, 19th century, maybe, uh, well, but we will get more about this. So we will have the presentation, more detailed presentation about these two data sets or the two projects with its kind of project scope and so on right away. Um, and this one is implemented in so-called APIs, which you also will learn, hear about more later, what, what that actually is. But I, spoiler, it's a framework to, for management of, of prosopographical data. Um, and the second project or data set is, is NAMPI, which is uh, financed by the yeah, Go Digital uh, uh, funding scheme. Uh, but you will also hear about it more uh, in the presentations uh, called NAMPS and MONKS prosopographical interfaces. And why we chose these data sets? Uh, so they have a similar domain of discourse. They both talk about prosopographical data. Uh, there may even be overlaps with respect to the persons they or we thought there will be overlaps. We unfortunately, spoiler, find out that there are none, but there could have been, uh, right? So because we, it's around the same time. Um, anyhow, but the, the important thing is basically it's the same kind of information, but uh, these two projects uh, chose quite different ways of modeling. And so this is what we want to discuss today and also dive into deeper tomorrow. Uh, what, uh, how, how, what were these approaches? What are the specifics of them? What are the pros and cons? Uh, and how we can then still build the bridges, how we can make interoperability happen, even though uh, the, the originating data models are quite different. We will have today well, more or less theoretical discussion or conceptual. So we will try to keep it, keep you away from or, or spare you the technical details, uh, but they will come tomorrow. So we will want to concentrate tomorrow. We will introduce some basic technical concepts or, or concepts that we need to, to discuss the data modeling on the practical side uh, and also to really work with the data. Uh, that will be tomorrow, and then we will try to be as practical tomorrow to really uh, explore the data uh, within an a, a application, exploring different aspects, aspects of it. We will find out about this tomorrow. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you will you heard that, that this theoretical discussion is done now. We will have presented the two uh, the two applications or projects, and then we will have discussions discussion about those. First, commenting, commenting by kind of two external experts, and then mixing into roundtable where everybody can can chip in. Um, and I think by that, I could leave it with that. Thank you, Mate, for this very uh, concise overview. Um, so the next person who will take the floor is Daniel Yella. 
and the nuns and monks prosopographical interfaces and I can see Daniel already. Yeah, so um, today I wanted want to talk about um, nuns and monks prosopographical interfaces. It's quite a bit of a name. Um, at first, I sh shortly give you an introduction about what we wanted to do in this project, um, what our main aims were, were and um, what the current status is very briefly. And then I want to talk um, about the main focus of today's day, uh, about what decisions we took um, when modeling our data and a bit why we did it, uh, the way we did and what we did. So, um, okay. So mainly, as, as you've all already heard, um, we are a project that is funded in the Go Digital Next Generation um, program by the Austrian Academy of Sciences. So thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> um, our project runtime ends this year and our main goal was was twofold so on the one hand um, we saw that from our perspective there are many um, prosopo prosopographical projects um, that deal with similar data um, that that use very very difficult uh, different and difficult to, to interpret um, data with different technologies different um, um, data structures and as I have been part of some workshops on, on um, creating some kind of, of structuralized and sim simple API from, for prosopographic data that could be generally uh, reusable, we, we wanted to give this a try and come up with a, a, a description of how prosopographic data could look and with a system that makes people um, makes it easy for people and for projects to implement this, this, this API and this model for their own data. Um, and in the second step, we wanted to use this system ourselves um, and try it out on a specific kind of, of, of data um, topic. Um, we created, um, we, using this, this, this system, we call it NumPy Core, um, we created a, a prosopographical database um, that contains and will contain um, data on, on early modern nuns and um, monks mainly, and people related to that, uh, related to monasteries. Um, yeah, so that's important to keep in focus. Um, when what, what our main goal from a data perspective was, was not to come up with one single model that fits um, this um, specific data topic, but we wanted to create something that is reusable for different sources, but still um, expressive enough to give detailed insights into data. Because one of our biggest problems with other data was that sometimes um, you only have thing once and hopefully somebody will be interested in it. Okay, so um, the main participants just briefly are um, Two colleagues from the University of Vienna, Dr. Irene Rabel and Magister Patrick Fiske, um, a colleague from the University of Graz, um, Sebastian Stoff, and myself uh, mainly work at uh, the International Center for Archival Research. But you may also have seen me in relationship to the Time Machine project. That's a, that's a bit of a buzzword going around sometimes. Um, yeah, so the current state is we complete, completed most of the work on the, on the back end. Um, that can be installed and reused um, by other people um, if they have a bit of a um, background uh, with uh, using Docker-based software. We have also a front end. What is still missing a bit is the editor functionality. Uh, that's still work in progress, but will be uh, finished hopefully soon. Um, we have um, a database of around 450 persons from not yet otherwise published um, analog sources, and we are in the process of reinterpreting data that's available in several other databases that we are in contact with. So there will be much more data in the future. And hopefully there will also be more overlaps with uh, things like big four. But currently, yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the problem with um, early modern um, non um, famous personalists, sometimes you only have them in one source and the chance that they are mentioned somewhere else is kind of, of slim sometimes. So um, yeah, that's what, what the status quo is and what we are doing. Um, you can have a look at all of it um, 
our primary website that's still in, in development. So currently, basically, it's the project um, information is nampi.ecarus.eu. And the actual data website that's built with our software and that can be uh, used for other things as well um, is on data.nampi.ecarus.eu. You can see find our GitHub repository and uh, the ontologies. Um, but keep in mind, all of it is still a um, work in process to, to some degree, um, even though the, the general structure is already more or less finished, but still some things, especially with the ontologies are, are um, changing. The main thing that you probably will wonder is, um, if I talk about uh, interoperability, why is it not yet visible into ontologies? That's because of practical reasons, we still don't have the, the connections to CDOC CRM and the factory model and so on included. But when you see later um, the names for the certain things, you can all already see that it's related to mainly CDOC CRM. Um, yeah, so just very, very briefly, a picture of our infrastructure. You don't have to understand that at all for now, and we will be mainly concerned with the, the right-hand part. Um, but still, um, we have a complete system created um, with a, a RDF database that contains all the data that we, we have that will be created by, by our users. Um, it also contains um, the, the ontologies, the, the source description or the, the, the model of the data. And it's shared with, um, yeah, with a, a data um, API creation software or, or, or library. We use um, Java and Spring Boot. And that makes the data available on the one hand for our official, official web client in a structured way. That's what we mean with API. But at the same time, um, people using it either from the perspective of people using our own software, but also from the perspective of other persons using our software for their own purposes, they also can access the, the data directly by using the same URLs um, in, in a, a client like Postman. You just have to, to add a, a, an HTTP header that says what kind of data format you want. And to get the actual raw data, um, you will have to choose uh, some, some RDF format like um, JSON-LD or something like that. Um, but that's already too much into the technical details. So let's move on to um, the actual data model that we use. Um, so mainly we decided after some consideration um, that we wanted um, to create a system that, that, that um, on the one hand, of course, um, models um, completely the, the, the prosopographical data that we are interested in. But at the same time, we wanted um, to keep the scientific, as we said, interpretation process um, visible to make, um, for on the one hand, to make it clear who said what, but on the other hand, to make it clear that all this data is not actual facts about some, something or somebody, but it's interpretation of, of primary or secondary sources. So it's always the opinion of somebody. And there can also, of course, be a different, differing uh, or different opinions on the same source, on the same piece of information. So we decided to base our, our core data workflow, so to say, on the, the widely discussed factoid model um, that, that basically simplified says something like like you see here on this slide somebody a scientist some an author interprets a, a source location of course that happens on a specific date but the main part is he or she interprets a location in a primary or secondary source and gets out of this source some some information related in this prosopographical um, context related to the life of the specific person and additional data about what actually happened at, at this event. So that's that's the main part that we wanted to um, express in the basic of our software that we called NumPy Core. Um, it's information on who says something on a specific source location and what these, these people actually say. Um, so for us, the main um, the main information piece is, is grouped around, around an event. 
And when I say event, I don't mean something like um, you visit a football match and everybody else visits the same football match. For us, this event is focused on a, on a specific person. We call it the, the, the main participant, the main person, basically. Um, and everything else that, that is related to this event is also related mainly to this main person. But of course, there can be other participants, as you see on this slide, like groups of people, like people. Um, this event probably, or not probably, because everything happens at a specific date at, on a specific location. So you get this basic um, thing that you probably expect when you talk about uh, events in the life of a person. And we tried to, to think of how to best model the actual thing that, that, that happens at this event. And we have two different levels of possibility. So in the end, the different projects can choose what they, they see mo most appropriate for their thing. Either you can, can try to create different kinds of events, or you can try to enrich these events um, with something that we call aspects, like things that, that, that happen at this event. It can be something very, very, um, uh, yeah, that can be something that, that's very widely ranging from, it can be the, the, the kind of a new job that somebody gets, an office that the person uh, started, a role or a status in a, in a group of people, in a, a group of people in that concept is everything ranging from families to com companies to um, church and monastic communities and so on. So we really try to, to give it a, a person-centered focus. So when we talk about groups, we are also talking about groups of people um, that are, are, are doing something with each other within uh, this, this group. Um, yeah, so this is um, what, we, what we tried to make the basis of this, this um, data system that we wanted to be usable for, for different kinds of um, prosopographical projects not really thinking on only that, that, that it only fits to, I don't know, church life in early modern times or sports teams um, or, or groups of, of different kinds of, of manual laborers or, or whatever. We wanted to, to make this as reusable as possible while still being able to say, even if we connect two different data sources or two different um, installations from NAMPI, we can say, Okay, this is an event that happens in a specific uh, place and on a specific time. Um, it happens to something that is, that is um, in our interpretation, a person, and that's the same as a person in, in CDOC CRM, also a widely um, used um, metadata scheme, so to say. Um, and an event is something that happens in this life of this person. And you can at least say, if you don't, provide any additional detail, um, basically what happened, uh, what, what persons were connected with each other. But then we wanted to give the opportunity to not only use this generalized model, but to extend it um, with the needs of, of different kinds of projects that, that deal with different kinds of prosopographical data. Um, so we tried, uh, so we, 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 we chose, um, the way to do it in, this, in the sense that we have a, a core data model, that's what I described for uh, in the last few minutes, that organizes this general workflow, like scientists interpreting something in sources that happens in the lives of people on specific dates with the partic participation of other people, and give them the possibility to formulize their own um, ontology, their own data model, based on our NAMPI core. So they would, would use this concept of event, this concept of person, but extend this in, in ways that they see fit. They could um, add different two groups of, of, of uh, different types of groups, like companies, like uh, monastic communities, like religions, like whatever. They could, if they want, um, of course, create different kinds of sources, like books, like uh, websites, like, specific kinds of books like handwritten books and so on, if they see the need for it. And they of course can create different kinds of events or different kinds of aspects that are interrelated and that model exactly what they want to express 
in their own um, context. And that's what we then did with our own data model, our, our own data type or data topic, um, this monastic community. We call it a monastic life because it's basically around things that, that can happen with people that, that are part of, of um, monastic communities like monasteries and abbeys and so on. So we did what, what other projects can do as well. We decided on a specific way that we want to use the possibilities of this NumPy core software. Um, for us, we mainly extended the groups with different kinds of, of groups uh, that are focused on these this monastic um, functionalities and religious um, stuff. We didn't so much go into detail about what different kinds of jobs somebody could have in early modern times, because that was not, not really the focus, but that would be possible, of course, as well. And we extended the aspects, and uh, you will shortly see what I mean with that. Um, but this is present um, in form of, of, of a, a data ontology that um, is based on this NumPy core stuff. So for instance, um, when you have the possibility in, in NumPy core generally to have something that's in CDOC CRM called appellation, you, we in NumPy core decided that we need uh, family names, we need given names, and we need religious names in the sense that if you become part of a monastery, you get a new name. Um, for groups, for instance, that's really just a, a short um, part and short example of, of the whole thing um, to give you an impression on how that, that could look. We, had, we decided we need um, families because um, that's something important in our sources. Where do the people come from? Different monastic communities, um, things like religious polities, what we, we consider a diocese, a parish, and so on, um, religious orders. And you can imagine many, many other things. Um, and with related relationships to it, so with uh, regard to aspects, as you can see, for us, for instance, it can be a status in a group. And it can be, for instance, somebody is a member of a specific group that is, in, in our case, also organized with these, these aspect things. Um, somebody can be, for instance, somebody that just visits um, a monastery, he can make a profession and then he can make different kinds of profession where he becomes either a core monk, a core nun, um, or a, a lay, lay monk, a lay sister that is a monk with a more a nun with a more manual focus in the everyday work and in the everyday life. And in that regard, we try to, to create extensions of this, this NumPy core data model, as I said, in the way that, that we see fit, that gives as the benefit in the architecture of NumPy core. And I'm just throwing that out there because it's a, it's a complex um, topic that you maybe will hear a little bit more about uh, tomorrow or hopefully you already know about. Um, the technology we use for NumPy um, RDF, and we have an RDF da database, means that we can do something that, that gives the computer the possibility to decide to. Uh, it, decide interim informations that are not explicitly stated in the database. So for instance, if we have something that is a, a specific community and that is in our database um, defined as a monastic community, then the computer can also directly say that this kind of thing is a group and that this kind of thing is an, an agent or for instance, for the, 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 um, the leader of a Dominican um, monastery, um, she can, she is a Dominican sub priorist, for instance, that's the, not the, the main leader, but the vice leader. That's a kind of vice community superior that in turn is a kind of community superior, which in turn is kind of status in groups, which in, in turn again is kind of aspect. In our, in our system, you have the possibility to filter and search for all these intermediary things. So that means you can, for instance, look for um, all superiors of a specific monasteries for all, all specific kind of leaders that's called prior in Carthusian monasteries that got um, this status before or after or during a certain time frame. Um, you can try to find out um, what kind of um, 
monasteries had some some community administrator in our database or even um, if you are interested in what kind of things people did in connection to a specific religious order or a specific monastery um, you can also look look this up and the interesting thing is that this is not something that we specified um, beforehand that's really only um, information that that comes um, from the combination of data entered in the database and these data models that these individual projects can add to their um, data. So this is not really something that is hard coded in the system. Um, so that means the main advantages, of course, are this is this is something rather flexible in, in that sense that you have this numpy core thing that you can extend um, in any way that, that you see fit. Um, it's reusable and with the connection to, to CDOC CRM, also, if you if you get the data via our API or if you export the data, um, you can at least somehow easily connect it to other things that are from from CDOC CRM um, or related things. That's what um, Mate before meant with uh, data interoperability. Really, very much depends on on what you actually want to do with the data. But still, at least we we tried to give. Um, people using our software, the possibility to specify what the things are as much as they see the need to. They can make it very simple, but if they want to, they can make very detailed uh, ontologies and so on. Of course, the, the advantage is that you need to do some additional work to get this um, expressiveness. You need to think of what kind of data you have and what you want to do with it. Um, as we did with the, the monastic life, of course, you can um, formulate this ontology in very different ways. Um, and one specific disadvantage of, of our specific thing is, it's not, the, everything is connected to these events, which means that you don't have a direct connection between what something is and the person. So you always have to go through these, these events, but this mainly is hidden from users because we have this um, pre-built um, API with already, the main questions and main um, queries pre-formulated. So you don't have to write these queries yourself. Um, yeah, so let me use the, the remaining time to just give you just one or two short examples. For instance, um, here we have one, one example that you all already saw that the, the terms beforehand, somebody became the prioress of Impact on a certain date. Um, it was a participant, the community was, was um, also participating in certain aspects. And so now let's try this out. That's just the, the live website. Um, of course, it, it will change in the coming, coming weeks uh, to be more easily usable. So it's really just a working process. But still, you see, you see everything that you needed to see. So here, this is the, the representation of these specific events. Um, you have the possibility to give um, labels in different languages and so on. You have this information on the Document Interpretation Act. Somebody, some scientist said something on the, 20, uh, the 2nd September 2020, and the source was a specific book. Um, and you can follow the link to the specific book. And for now, don't see very much additional detail, but at a certain time, you will see the list of all this information that comes from here. And then you see the details on the actual event in the sense that Okay, we have a, a date that is a bit unclear. It was not later than April 24 in the year 1524. That could be all different kinds of, of dating. We could have exact dates. We could have something that is probably not before and probably not after. So we could have date ranges and something that, that happened not later and not earlier. So you have a degree of, of, of freedom there. Um, it's um, related to an actual location that later on will give you also a map uh, with um, um, coordinates gotten from geonames, but still gives you the possibility to go to the place and see what, what happened here. So actually in this monastery, we have 347 events that happened there. Apparently many of them, the early ones are uh, about prioress and so on. And we have the other data. We have the main person that I also can, can open up. And we see for this specific person, we have four additional events, um, only one with a specific, um, at least a more general date. 
So she became the, the prioress before 1524. Um, she has a religious title also gotten from this event called Priorin. Um, she is the family member of a specific person that we call from Hayao. That's, um, so you see also the families are, are um, groups in there and so on. And to just give you a short example to how this, this interaction between these different kinds of things work. The main, as I said, the main focus is the events. And here you have the possibility, for instance, to filter what kind of aspects you're interested in when this event is used. And for instance, if we pick clergy, um, you see there is all sorts of different kinds of things. And if I then click on become archdeacon, that's an event. I see here, okay, that was used in a specific um, that is a specific event that used this aspect called Archdeacon. And if I visit that, I see on the one hand what this Archdeacon actually is in our system. It's a kind of clergy and a status. And at the same time, this clergy in our interpretation is also an occupation, which means more like a job. Um, we currently have two different persons that did this job, one before 1639 and one after 1643 and so on. So you can imagine how that um, yeah, works in general. And yeah, actually, I think that's about it. Um, as, as you see, um, there is, there is uh, several ways where you can, can um, browse data, look for data, you can directly filter it. Um, of course, there is also a text search, you can limit by date and so on. Um, and all of that that you can use on this website, you can also directly with a, an, an API or with a diff, uh, that is an API, you can use it to create different kinds of websites that are specifically tailored to, to your own um, data model where you have much more uh, interactive things like timelines and um, diagrams and whatnot. Some of them we will also create uh, later on when we make this website even better even better <laughs> sorry um and um, but still the data actually is, is reusable for whatever kind of thing you want just by using general um, web standards like http requests yeah so that's about it thank you daniel brilliant completely on time i'm, I'm very impressed by all your timekeeping really <laughs> okay um matthias i'm just gonna pass on to you thanks very much yeah, so I want to start with um, the team that is working on the WIGPRO uh, from the database uh, side of the project. Um, so WIGPRO is, I'm going to speak about the systems a bit later, uh, is built on the APIS platform and <clears throat> there are several contributors to the platform. Main, the main uh, person developing for WIGPRO at the moment is Gregor Piergi. Um, but there are others who worked, like Sabine Lasakovic, who worked on the NLP, Stefan Resch and uh, uh, Backend, also uh, who I forgot here, uh, Peter Andorf, who also worked on the backend, and uh, Stefan Post and Arnold Graf on front ends and visualizations, uh, Barbara Kautgartner also on the front end, and Richard Hedden, Carla Ewell, and Ingo Berner, mainly on the CDOC CRM modeling that we will also speak uh, about in a bit. So what I want to speak about today is uh, I will start with uh, uh, kind of the bigger picture to uh, um, speak about what was already mentioned several times, namely the interoperability of uh, data and why that makes sense. So we'll have a short uh, slide on the infrastructure and the tools at the ACDH. And then I will uh, uh, quickly run you through the APIS platform and some apps that we build on, uh, with uh, that platform. Then uh, we'll dive into uh, the uh, Viennese court project. So there are several projects that will work, work into uh, one and the same prosopographical database. Um, and then I will speak about a bit uh, on specific requirement, requirements from WICPRO and the WICPRO workflow uh how we ingested the data how we are working on ingesting the data uh including the nlp pipeline and then i will uh speak a bit about uh the week pro modeling namely the CDOC crm um, uh, modeling that we implemented 
And then there is a big slide with all the things that are still to come because Wigpro is uh, just was just started in autumn last year, and there's still a lot uh, to to be done. So we are far from uh, finished. Yes. So you can see the uh, pre uh, find the presentation under this um, um, uh, website and click yourself through and send me questions if you want to. The Wigpro uh, project website is under wigpro.org.seat, um, where you can also find uh, presentations and updates on the project. So the bigger picture. Um, so we're at the ACDH, uh, we have, uh, I would say, four main core services uh, that I called here ACDH Knowledge Graph, um, uh, which uh, of some of them, like the Omnipod, are uh, still in development, but others, like the Ache, which is our long-term uh, uh, preservation uh, system, uh, are still working, also the walkups and the Histokis uh, platform. So Omnipod, uh, we're currently working on that and you will uh, have the chance, I think uh, Mate is going to uh, show it tomorrow a bit, is uh, based on a triple store and uh, using the research space platform that you will definitely see tomorrow um, as we provided uh, uh, prepared and research space platform for the, for the uh, workshop tomorrow. Um, um allows so uh, we we use that system as a kind of an end or we plan on using that system as a kind of an entity store where all the APIS instances for example that we use for prosopographical uh, uh, data research projects store serialize their data too where we can harmonize the data coming from different projects and that we can uh, uh, after harmonizing again, provide via either RDF, SparkQL, or uh, REST API endpoints as, as JSON, for example. And then uh, uh, digital editions and other projects that we're hosting at the Institute or running at the Institute can use this entity store, this harmonized entity store for uh, enriching their data, for example, for annotating uh, in TI uh, or for uh, uh, working on prosopographical data. Same goes for uh, the walkups, uh, which is a service uh, using Scosmos um, that uh, uh, provides SCOS vocabularies to our projects, but also other people interested. The Histokis is a system that we uh, set up uh, a few years ago, um, and it's holding shape files, temporalized shape files from uh, the 18th and 19th century with uh, a focus on uh, Austrian Hungarian monarchy and the, uh, yeah, mainly on the Austrian uh, Hungarian monarchy. So uh, as I said, uh, in the overall picture, we have several interoperable tools uh, that we put together uh, and hope that uh, will create some kind of a, a bigger knowledge graph uh, for the Institute. These are the APIs instances, for example, uh, for example, that we that we will that I will speak about and that we'll use for uh, prosopographical projects that we can use as entity stores. There is the APIs hub that then uh, allows you to uh, uh, do uh, network visualizations on all of these APIs instances. There is Histogis, as I said, with 19 early 20th century maps. There is the Omnipod that is not finished yet and not pub, uh, publicly available yet, but we, we hope to make it available. Um, and that will uh, combine uh, 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 entities from different sources and harmonize them. And there is the uh, nerd pool that we use for um, uh, creating NLP or creating training data for NLP model models. And there is a space app for um, uh, running NLP models on some data. Okay, back to uh, the Viennese court projects. So there are currently two different projects running at the IHB, IHB one of uh, Academy Institutes uh, on the Viennese court. One is this Wigpro that uh, we already spoke about. It's run by Marian Romberg and Maximilian Kaiser. Um, and we are providing the uh, database and the technical uh, uh, part of it. It's funded by the Innov Innovationsfonds. And there is a second project uh, that uses the same prosopographical database uh, called the Wiener Hof Eliten und Herrsch und Herrschaften und Repräsentationen, uh, which is uh, run by Katrin Keller and is an FWF project. And there, uh, uh, Katrin Keller uh, got another uh, project 
um, uh, funded from FWF that will uh, start in um, autumn that will be mainly uh, a digital edition, but also use uh, the, this uh, prosopographical database as a kind of an entity store to link uh, and uh, uh, the entities that are annotated to. Yes, so uh, what did the WIGPRO project requirements look like? So uh, the main goal of WIGPRO is to uh, provide a prosopographical database. Uh, it should be extendable for more data sets to come. So the hope is that there will be more projects. There are already two and there's a third one to start, but the hope is that there won't, will be even more projects and that we can then uh, uh, build up the database with more data. There was the need for a front end to, to curate the data. So basically a website uh, to curate uh, the uh, entities. Uh, and we wanted an API to automatically ingest uh, the data and then uh, retrieve it or uh, serialize it to uh, things like the uh, Omnipod. And there was the need for a pipeline for data ingestion as uh, we will see that in a moment. Um, uh, Wigpro is built upon uh, three, um, four actually, uh, legacy data sets, free Excel sheets, and access database. So, Wigpro um, um, itself only on the free Excel sheets, but the FWF project is uh, built on an access database. And we needed to, uh, or we need to, um, uh, uh, um, modify that data and ingest it into our new system. And I put that in red and a bit bigger as we uh, really underestimated how, much, I mean, we knew that it is legacy data and it's difficult, but we underestimated how difficult it actually uh, became. So how does it look like? So you see in the upper uh, section of the screen, one of these rows uh, in the Excel sheet with a name, uh, two uh, second names, uh, a title, then here the gender, and then there is this big section of the functions uh, that he had in the courts. So Reichshofrat, 1661 to 1682, and so on and so forth. And that is mainly only partly structured data. We thought at the beginning that they used a very consistent uh, uh, layout, but they didn't really do that. So that's why we ended uh, um, up with uh, using NLP pipelines to um, actually uh, uh, convert that again back to structured uh, relations like the ones that you see below. So these are here now relations in the APIS uh, instance with a start and an end date, a relation type, and then a related institution. So this person, Minnigrets Gottlieb, is related as a Geheimerat to an entity that was here called Dummy Hofstadt as we didn't, uh, or as the pipeline didn't correctly um, uh, find uh, the correct Hofstadt. Yes. So now uh, a few words on the APIS platform that we are using uh, for WIGPRO. I will run through that a bit as I think a lot of the people already know that. So it's uh, the Austrian Prosopographical information system. It was a project that was originally funded by the Nationalstiftung and ended in March 2020. And the goal was to semantically enrich the Uber biographies, the Austrian biographical dictionary bi biographies, and create prosopographical data out of it. Uh, and for that end, we created this API software um, and that we are now currently using in several different projects, one of which is the WIGPRO. Uh, the ideas of that software was to use a very simple data model. I will speak about that in just a minute and serialize it later in various other formats. So currently we are serializing the data of the APIs into CDUC CRM RDF, TI, uh, and an IPIF uh, uh, JSON format and an internal JSON format that uh, represents the internal data uh, model. Uh, it should use rock solid and widely used software stack so that it uh, um, has less bugs and is easy, better documented, easier to develop. And we wanted to have a hybrid approach. So we need an API uh, for uh, pi automatic pipelines to also uh, access um, the database and researchers uh, could access the database via the, um, the front end and work uh, and edit the data via the front end. So that's the technical stack. It's Django, MySQL, uh, Stamble, which we're not really using anymore, uh, spacing gate for NLP. 
now to the data model. So the data model, the internal data model consists of four, five core entities, persons, places, institutions, works, and events. The system itself actually is extendable. So uh, it's very easy to add new uh, entity types if you need them and also relations between them. And uh, front end actually automatically adapts to these changes in the data model. But uh, the the core uh, data is using only these five entities. All of these entities can be interrelated, and um, the fixed there is a fixed set of relation types. Uh, we call it a bit mini event. So every rela uh, relation has a start and end date, and a few other uh, attributes. There can be unlimited full text attached to the entities. So for the uh, original APIS project, these were the biographies. Uh, for Wikipro, for example, these are the full text as originally found in, in the Excel sheets that you saw before. And uh, these um, uh, full texts can be uh, annotated and the annotations, uh, again, uh, related to entities and relations between entities. And the annotations can be organized in projects. These are offset annotations. So we only store uh, the, the start and end uh, character in the text. So uh, that allows you to uh, uh, annotate the same data multiple times. Uh, so an NLP pipeline could annotate the biography, but at the same time a researcher. And then you have two different annotations. Um, and the entities are organized in collections. That's not really interesting. So you see here a minimized version of the data model. The blue uh, 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 rectangles here are the entities, persons, places, institutions. They can all have relations to each other. Also persons can have relations to persons. And uh, the green uh, here are the text and the annotations. So uh, all entities can have texts attached and uh, all texts in return can have annotations. Uh, attached that uh, again point towards relations or entities. All of the uh, entities are identified via several URIs uh, that are in the serialization then um, um, uh, serialized as uh, all same as uh, and all entities and relations between entities can be typed with SCOS uh, vocabularies. There is also what is not included here in the picture uh, a source uh, table where uh, we store the source of the original information for a relation, an entity, or any other uh, uh, bit. Yes, so the tool itself allows for list views, detail views, create views. Um, uh, so you can uh, edit all the data that is there. Uh, one thing that uh, turned out to be very helpful was the autocompletes for entities. So if you're working on a person, you can, uh, and you want to relate that person to a place, uh, you can uh, search for a for the place in an autocomplete. And the autocomplete not only searches through uh, your internal database, but it also searches through uh, external reference resources such, such as the GND or GEO names. And if, uh, if you don't find it in your internal database and select one of the external uh, entities, then it fetches the RDF from GEO names and imports it into your local instance and relates uh, the entity you're currently working on to that uh, uh, new created entity. Uh, by that, you make a, uh, a kind of a copy of, uh, uh, of a reference resource entry that you can then also change. That uh, was needed because our researchers in the Uber found that a lot of ours, at least, it's happening very often that G and D entries are not correct, and they wanted to correct that. Yes, that's on the end. so that's how it looks like. I'm going to run through that. There's a detail page on the right side. Uh, you see the relations, how and you can relate it to. This is one of these autocompletes. You see here uh, the G and D entries for a search for academy. Um, with uh, some additional information on that academy, academy that you know what you're selecting. Here are the annotations. You just highlight the text, and then you get a context menu and can uh, and select the time type uh, of relation uh, and, uh, annotation that you want to uh, create. And then you get a form like uh, we saw in the uh, uh, picture before with autocompletes and so on and so forth. And you can store that. Uh, yeah, we also created some network visualizations, but we'll see in a minute a, a nicer version of that. 
And as I said before, we're already using that system for several other projects, so that, such, such as the Personen der Modernen Basis, uh, the prosopography of the members of the Austrian Academy, uh, the ministerial protocols of the Austrian Hungarian monarchy, and others more. So here I'm going to quickly show you one of the systems that a colleague, uh, Stefan Probst, built upon uh, the different uh, APIs instances, what we call APIs hubs. So these are all the instances that we're currently running and you can use the APIs hub here for doing uh, network analysis on one of the instances. This is now the persona and the modern basis. Uh, and you can, for example, say you want to have a uh, all the relations between persons and institutions we've worked for. And if you click on that, you'll see get the network and you can then download it here. So uh, show the selection details uh, of the entities and so on and so forth. Yes, then here is another uh, uh, front end that uh, Stefan Probst created on an APIS instance that's for a solar project on the um, uh, Genese of the Sunday uh, from, yeah, um, he did a beep swarm uh, and uh, uh, any uh, visualization on top of an APIS instance. And one more, this is the uh, APIS instance that is using the uh, Austrian Biographical Dictionary uh, here. And there is a visualization on top of the API that, uh, and, uh, um, Arnold Graf created, and I wanted to show that because here we see the, inter, uh, the interrelation with the Histokis project. So we are fetching here on the fly uh, the, uh, the correct um, um, uh, shape files from the Histokis API and adding it to, uh, to this visualization. So you can see here now the correct borders of that uh, time. And here you see the lifeline, the distances uh, of the, of the changing places he, he, he was at um, or during his life. Okay, so now uh, back to uh, VicPro. There is an import workflow that we're currently working on. So as I said, we have several um, uh, original resources. Um, these um, Excel sheets uh, from the legacy projects, the access database, but also additional Excel sheets uh, that uh, Marianne Romberg and her colleagues uh, created. And all of that goes into GitLab. And whenever something is changed, uh, CICD uh, pipeline is uh, triggered and that uh, runs some tests on these import scripts if they correctly uh, uh, um, um, put together uh, data together. And if not, they fail. At least that's the uh, idea behind it. it's not uh, working yet. And then we uh, improve the import scripts and run the tests again, uh, as long as until the tests don't fall anymore. Then it's first imported into a test database where we, where the researchers can then do a manual check. And once uh, uh, the check is done, we merge the code into the master branch and the import is run on the production database. So the NLP, as I said before, uh, there is a lot of unstructured text in, um, or the same structured text in, in this legacy data. And we have an NLP uh, training workflow for that. So uh, one of the uh, researcher colleagues, Maximilian Kaiser, he annotated these uh, sections that you saw before on the, on the different functions somebody had. And uh, we use these annotations for training the model, uh, evaluate then the model on a, uh, on a, uh, a gold st uh, uh, standard set. Uh, and, uh, and if it's not good enough yet, then we go back to annotation and uh, uh, do more annotating. Uh, at the same time, we have a rule-based uh, pipeline that goes more or less the same. And we harmonize then the output of these two pipelines and the annotate uh, at these pipelines uh, or ha the harmonized uh, annotations of these two pipelines uh, are then uh, stored. And then we have some post-processing running uh, that you see here. So the first there's the tokenizer, then this is the named entity recognizer and the, the rules that are annotating the entities uh, and including the dates and times and so on and so forth. And then we include the existing annotations and with these do some uh, uh, we start then these post-processing uh, things that you see here, extending the entities, 
um, you're removing some patterns. We know of that uh, uh, NLP pipelines always annotate the wrong way, uh, rename some of the functions, uh, do some date prepositions, uh, pre uh, so um, extract the uh, around, uh, before, and so on and so forth. And then we create so-called chunks out of that. And the chunk is always a function, uh, a time period, uh, and a Hofstadt, so a, a chord. Uh, and these uh, are then put together to these relations that you saw before. Okay, now um, the few last minutes that I have um, on uh, the actual RDF uh, model that we are using, or at least planning on using. This is the CDOC CRM. So um, that is the conceptual reference model of the International Committee for Documentation, uh, which is an ISO standard for the controlled exchange of cultural heritage information. And it's not only an ISO standard, it has become kind of a de facto those standard in the DH in the recent years. Um, the CRM itself is a document defining classes in scope nodes rather than an implementation. Matteo already spoke about that a bit in his presentation before. Uh, so um, the CRM is only defining the classes, but not really creating an implementation. I mean, there is an implementation uh, by uh, fourth in Crete, um, uh, the institute who also um, is mainly in charge of uh, running the CRM, um, which is an RDFS implementation of the CDOC CRM, and they also publish it on their website. But there is also a second one, uh, which is pretty famous, which is the Erlangen CRM an implementation in OWL uh, that was created for use in Whiskey and is still used in Whiskey. And yeah, the CRM is event-centered and it's in high, so-called high-level ontology. So now I'm going to talk a bit about the shortcomings of the CDOC CRM, at least uh, as far as I think uh, or came across during the development. Um, one of the uh, biggest shortcomings, in my opinion, is that um, um, there is no versioning of the official versions published on the CDOC CRM website. So every class, even if you use um, uh, 6.2.1, which is the latest um, version that they suggest to use, uh, the class will resolve to uh, version 504, which is the ESO standard version, uh, but is already more than eight years old, I think. So nobody's using it anymore, but uh, the class is resolved to that. Um, then for the Erlangen CRM, one of the problems is that not all of the extensions have been uh, um, oh. um, published by er Erlangen. So there is uh, uh, one more thing is that there is no native possibility to add simple attributes. So that is what uh, Daniel also was uh, uh, speaking about before. Everything is an event and you cannot really attach something like uh, uh, a gender or, or a profession directly uh, to a person. Uh, but there is uh, uh, uni is here and they uh, in Finland, they uh, developed BOCRM, which introduces a, a unary role that allows things like that. Maybe uni will speak about a bit about that uh, later. And yes, uh, CRM uh, creates fairly complex RDFs. So uh, it, for example, for modeling a birth event, you need five nodes uh, plus edges between these nodes. Um, that is uh, then difficult for front ends and systems. So now let's have a uh, look at what we are using currently in uh, Week Pro. So that is an uh, um, OWL, um, uh, Carla Eber, one of our colleagues, uh, created for uh, the APIS instances and special uh, the, the uh, Week Pro instance. And you see here this E21 person uh, in the middle that. Um, um, is attached to a birth and death events uh, that again can then be attached to these time spans uh, below here. And that is then uh, again needs P82 end of the end and P82 uh, A beginning of the beginning. That's why you need 
pretty lot of uh, a pretty big path to get to the actual date of birth of a person, for example. And here uh, we have uh, the E74 group. That is the second uh, important uh, thing in our model. Um, people can join and leave uh, via these joining and uh, leaving events. Uh, E85. 86 uh, leaving uh, 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 groups and groups are uh, all kind of institutions. Um, for example, the Obersthofmeisteramt in Wigpro is a group, the uh, uh, court uh, is a group, uh, and these groups um, have then um, that is not here, but it's, they have an E55 type uh, attached that can then have an appellation. So uh, names, identifiers, all kind of things that identify um, uh, an, inst an in instance uh, of this class. Um, yeah. And we use scores vocabularies for that. Yes. So that's basically it. Then there is, as I said before, still a lot to come. Um, we need to import the rest of the data. So currently we have only imported uh, one uh, of the um, uh, uh, data sets that uh, I spoke about. Uh, we imported actually the second one just yesterday, but we found out that it import did not really work very well. So we'll need to get back to that. And then we need to have semi-automatic scripts for deduplication. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the inst so we will have uh, more than 50,000 uh, instances after importing all the uh, sources, uh, but uh, that will boil down to less than 10,000 after we deduplicated uh, everything because a lot of the uh, entities are mentioned uh, in, uh, in all the uh, legacy resources. Then we need to do some modeling of the provenance. Um, as you saw before, uh, all our data model is currently about the entities and the instances uh, and not about uh, uh, where that comes from, uh, the uh, accuracy uh, of the NLP pipeline that extracted something and so on and so forth. So we need to add that uh, provenance data um, uh, to our uh, data set. Yes, and then uh, website-wise, we will need, of course, custom templates, including visualizations, things like that, what I showed before uh, we did with uh, other APIs instances. Uh, in, for example, a tree of the offices of the court. And then uh, we will publish all the data in various formats. So we did that before, uh, for example, with the biographical dictionary. So in JSON, at least TI, the, the API system also serializes in TI. We didn't publish uh, the whole data set in TI um, for the uh, Uber data, but we will see. And uh, in RDF, yeah, that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthias, brilliant. As you can really see, very different from um, the first model that we saw. Hello, Thomas. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, my name is Thomas Walnick from the University of Vienna, and I have the pleasure to chair uh, the rest of this afternoon session. So um, I suppose that uh, by now you will have realized uh, the scope of our tripartite structure of this event. In the first step, we wanted to present you with two, uh, if you will, neighboring models um, dealing with um, similar groups of people, but choosing different um, technical approaches. Now, in a second step, we would like to discuss these two models. Um, first, with two colleagues from Finland and the Netherlands who have been and are in close contacts with the ACDH and the University of Vienna and others among us. And then after having, um, so to say, prepared the floor um, for the kinds of questions that can be asked, we would like to open up the discussion and invite um, all of you who are here in the audience to um, join us. Uh, I will be moderating the discussion and I would like to ask everyone from the outset to only use the chat function so that I can keep track um, of the questions being asked. I realize that sometimes you will want to ask them while um, people speak sometimes afterwards. So um, that way I can keep the order. Um, tomorrow, that's going to be the third step. 
we're going to try and make these two models talk in a three hands-on sessions, which relate to vocabularies, ontologies, and instances. And if you would like to see us basically practice what we preach, um, join us tomorrow from 9.15 onwards uh, and, and see us try and put that into practice. Um, the event will be closed by a um, wrap-up session in which I again will try to moderate um, the results, so the, 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 um, the results of these discussions. Um, and given that this was a question before, we tried to document uh, this whole exchange on our um, Digital Habsburg platform website, and I suppose also on the ACDH Tool Gallery website. Uh, the idea is really not to lose um, the thoughts and the considerations that uh, are pertinent to these topics. If you have a look around the, the participants list and even the, the panelists list here, you will realize that this is basically the whole of Europe. Um, and so um, it's, it's important that to some degree we keep track and we are also able to return to what has been said and we don't reinvent the wheel. That being said, I'm very, very happy to introduce to you um, Victor de Boer. He is an assistant professor at the University of Amsterdam at the um, uh, computer science department. I will put into the chat two things that I found particularly interesting about his work. Intavia is an EU funded project um, um, on uh, tangible and non-tangible cultural heritage, which brings Victor also into contact with uh, Matthias Schlögl and colleagues at the ACDH. Um, I found particularly interesting his um, reaching out into uh, cultural heritage and colonial pasts um, topics, which I think is, is a very timely uh, thing to, to think about. But I would also like to show him um, in a broader sense as a computer scientist connecting artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. Um, if you follow this link, Juni Tonominen, on the other hand, comes to us from the University of Helsinki in Finland. Um, he is a uh, research coordinator at the Department of Cultural, Cultures, Digital Humanities, uh, and has been involved together with some of his colleagues in Alto in some large uh, semantic web um, infrastructure initiatives in Finland. So I'll post uh, one of these things here. Um, and our paths have crossed together with some uh, other colleagues in the audience uh, years ago in the context of the cost action reassembling the Republic of Letters, where indeed uh, Yoni, um, again, with some colleagues, um, did contribute a piece on BioCRM uh, to our collective volume, if you go to page 134. So um, the plan now is that first Victor and then Yoni um, take their 10 to 15 minutes to have their say about what they find interesting, remarkable, um, wrong, <laughs> good um, about the two models and their potential interoperability. The floor is yours. Thank you for, very much for the wonderful introduction, Thomas, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, and um, uh, and also, um, yeah, I'd like to express my uh, my uh, uh, amazement at the really nice models and projects that are being presented. I think uh, uh, there's a lot going on um, uh, in, in Austria with uh, digitization and then also the modeling of this kind of prosopographical uh, data. Um, so um, uh, as uh, Thomas already said, I'm a, a computer scientist uh, by trade. So my background is really in, the, in this uh, semantic web uh, data modeling, uh, knowledge representation. And then also uh, we are connecting to other types of artificial intelligence, uh, for example, doing uh, uh, learning on top of the knowledge graphs that we uh, would co connect in this way. And I've been doing that uh, partly in this domain of, uh, of digital humanities, working, for example, on a project uh, on uh, um, the East India Company and other uh, maritime uh, data sets. Uh, and there also we've looked at uh, uh, modeling different types of uh, data sets that existed uh, uh, before. Um, 
Uh, and, and that sort of brings me to my first uh, uh, comment, because one of the things that uh, that we found in these projects we were, where we were collaborating with people from uh, different um, uh, heritage institutions and, uh, and research institutions is that um, when you're building a, uh, let's say, a, a combined knowledge graph, right, which, which combines information from different uh, sources, um, and you present the results then to the to a user, for example, to a humanity scholar in some way, it's very crucial that you are able to, as a, as a user, to uh, trace back information to its original source. And you try to, you can understand as a, as a user, let's say in a very transparent way where information comes from and how it was combined and where, um, where uh, different uh, relations, uh, were, how they were established. And these can be established through you know, natural language processing, uh, but also it can be the result of a uh, of an annotation that was made either in the 19th century or in the 21st century or in the 17th century. Um, so what uh, what what uh, to me uh, is is uh, very nice is that in this factoid model, which was of course shown in this uh, in this first uh, in the first presentation, you really start with uh, with a, with a, uh, with the realization that we are dealing with, uh, let's say, interpretations of original sources. And even those in original sources, sources are also interpretations of, uh, of some, uh, some reality. Um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, everything that we've seen and all, in all the conversations that I've been having with, uh, with humanity scholars as well, is that this idea of provenance and traceability and, and transparency is very, uh, very key. So I think that's good to see in these, uh, in these uh, various models. Um, uh, and that uh, that connects uh, to this other point that I wanted to make, which is about uh, this idea of polyvocality. So that's uh, uh, um, now in the front of my mind because uh, also of this uh, this thing that Thomas mentioned, this idea of uh, of colonial uh, 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 heritage. Uh, so in the Netherlands, uh, we have a lot of uh, of our heritage is uh, comes from our colonial past and. Uh, objects uh, and information that comes uh, it, to our heritage institutions often got there in uh, disputable ways, right? So it can be either loot or it can be gifts given in specific power structures. And um, uh, I think all across uh, Europe uh, uh, and in also in other places, we're now researching to what extent uh, yeah, we should reevaluate uh, re these, uh, these traces. Um, and, um, and here digital methods can also uh, help. Um, but that also means that objects can have multiple meanings and uh, uh, for example this 19th century uh, example right so where we have an, uh, an object that is described or an uh, archival record that is described in the 19th century um, uh, but now we might actually look at this uh, in completely different uh, different ways um, and to be able to represent these multiple views on the same objects but also on the same documents or even on the same person is something that uh, that is very interesting um, uh, to uh, to many researchers and i think the nice thing is that uh, the types of models uh, that uh, matthias also showed so these these rdf models they actually allow you to have multiple views on the same objects or on the same person or on the same uh, source uh, at the same time uh, of course you then need to you know, be, let's say, voice aware and to be able to understand that there might be multiple representations of the same uh, object. Um, one very concrete example is uh, that we've, uh, one that I was involved in, in a project called BiographyNet in the Netherlands, where we also had, uh, we're dealing with biographical data for prosopographical uh, research. And there uh, we were working with the original uh, Biographisch Portal, biographical portal data from the Dutch uh, uh, Institute for uh, the Institute for Dutch uh, uh, History, the Huygens Institute. Um, and there we had uh, lots of uh, uh, people that were described by multiple biographies. And the, the biographies were actually there was metadata extracted from those biographies that represent the let's say the the view of that specific biography of a person. And because these biographies were often written by different people uh, in different uh, different uh, times, uh, you get actually different views. And these might be as banal as, as just, uh, let's say, having competing uh, birth dates for someone, right? So one record says that uh, Dutch politician Thorbecker was born in one day, one date, and another says that he was born on another date. So this is conflicting information. Um, and let's say typically in old, the old view would be that uh, we try to fix 
uh, this and try to consolidate it to one correct date. Um, but I think for most uh, most historians, uh, most uh, researchers, it's, it's, it's crucial that we keep these sort of multiple views uh, alive so that we can actually investigate them and understand why they might conflict. Um, and of course, for yeah, more complex things like uh, uh, yeah, uh, value and uh, understanding some uh, understanding someone's profession or role in a group, this is even more subtle. Uh, and having those uh, those uh, views alive uh, is, I think, very uh, very important. So um, I, I think the type of models that uh, uh, that the, both of the previous speakers uh, describe, um, because they use this uh, yeah, these semantic la web languages that are much more uh, open for um, heterogeneous and uh, multi-interpretable data, I think is a very good thing, and it would actually help in in uh, in allowing this polyvocal multiple view uh, um, um, analysis of data um, and while also keeping uh, this provenance of information and transparency where did information come from uh, alive so i have no idea how long i'm speaking but i guess it's time to <laughs> give the floor also to uni <laughs> um many thanks um i think we'll come back to that here victor um one fundamental point um Traceability, another fundamental point of polyfocality. I think we um, can take it from there. And now I'm curious to hear what uh, Yoni has to add. Uh, thank you, Thomas, uh, for your introduction. And, and thank you uh, for inviting me here today. So I've been pretty, very much enjoying the presentations today. Uh, Mate first by the, uh, the introduction on prosopographical data modeling and then the two specific data model data models by Daniel and Matthias. So I think the work by your projects uh, is very solid and I'm glad to see these data publication efforts. So well done. Uh, a brief uh, background of myself. So as Victor, I'm all, also a computer scientist. Uh, and my research has focused on publishing ontologies and data. Uh, also quite, quite much on data modeling, naturally, uh, and also tooling for digital humanities, for exam um, example, uh, tools for reconciling data coming from heterogeneous sources. Uh, many of the modeling issues that have been discussed today are quite familiar, and I, I have encountered them in, in the projects I've been working in, for example, dealing with early modern letters or the National Finnish Biography. Uh, so the both, both of the projects and therefore their data models, they share quite many aspects as we have heard today, but also they are quite different, obviously. Uh, so if you look at first at the, what, what they share in common on what, what is their base. So firstly, they both are based on or use linked data and RDF language. And as Victor already discussed, this is very, very nice for the fact that it allows for multi vocability. So it allows uh, the representation of different, different uh, interpretations and different, different views on the data. Uh, and also from, from maybe a more from a bit tech, technical uh, viewpoint, it has this very generic data model, which means that you can basically use it for modeling uh, different kinds of data. So not only prosopographical data, but other, other, let's say, cultural heritage data like museum item collections and so on. Also, with RDF, you can create an explicit, explicit schema for your data, which means that it's easier to document the data model and also communicate it to other, other audiences. And for example, you can use it for validating your data. So see that there is the, if there are any quality issues. Also, a one very important notion regarding linked data is the global identifiers. So different entities can, or they are given in, uh, identifiers, which then can be, which can then be used for referring these to these entities. So that's a very, very solid point here as well. Uh, regarding the actual data model, both of them use or will use, or at least map their data model to Cydox theorem, which is I think it's a very good approach. Uh, as Matthias said or described, Cydox CRM is an ISO standard, 
and it's used for harmonizing cultural heritage data. And what this means is that once again, we not only get interoperability between these prosopographical data, but on a uh, wider, wider uh, field of cultural heritage. So I won't go into details of CIDOC as, as Matthias already discussed this. Uh, the very strong point here is that you can extend the data model. That's very good. So uh, having in mind the specific requirements of individual data sets. The third point, which is uh, very solid here, is the use of external established vocabularies for linking entities in these data sets. Uh, to be used as a kind of an authority control. So both of the data sets use somehow different vocabularies, for example, geonames for places and so on. Then if we look a bit of the differences between these two data models. So if we first look at the NumPy, so there is a great focus on this manual or also automatic source interpretation and they use the factoid model ontology which i think suits very well for this kind of this kind of uh, need and is very good uh, another thing that has been discussed quite much already is the aspects of or roles that how this can be attached to events uh, so so in numbi they use this notion of aspects uh, also one one uh, thing that I liked about Numbi is that it, it kind of uh, uses modules for the different parts of the data model. So it has this core ontology with very, very uh, general classes and properties, and then this monastic life ontology, which, which is used for, for representing the specific roles and occupations and event types in this monastic, monastic life area. So this way you can, you can uh, share also not the core ontology, which then can be extended to the, but by other projects. Uh, and, and in this specific project, you use this more specific ontology. Then regarding Vic Pro, uh, they use directly this CIDOC CRM uh, standard model. And they also model these roles, but in a bit different way than NAMPI. So they use this CIDOC CRM PC proposal, which is made by the people at the Forge at Crete, the developers of CIDOC CRM. So this part is, as Matthias was discussing, it's not that straightforward to model these roles in, in RDF. So here they have this notion of property of a property, and it's not that straightforward to do. And this is one, one option to do it. And there are many, many options for doing this. One of them being the bio CRM that Matthias was referring to. And there are also other options. For example, in Victor's work with a simple event model, they have used different technical solutions. So the bottom line here is that this is not an easy task to implement these roles in RDF. And there are different, different ways to do 